Right, good evening everybody. Um, welcome to the Corporate Scrutiny Committee of Tamarborough Council on the 21st of June. Um, before we move on to the first agenda item, apologies, I just want to welcome, uh, we've got some new members this year, which is good, uh, on the committee. Uh, Council Denny Cook, Chris Cook, uh, John Harper, Shree People, Sam Smith and John Wade. So welcome. Uh, and I just want to remind everybody that it is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube. Um, <clears throat> we have apologies so far from Councillor Danny Cook and Councillor John Wade. Do we have any others at all? No. Thank you very much. Next item is appointment of a vice chair. So I seek nomination and a seconder, please, by show of hands. Councillor Sam Goodall. Happy. Sorry, Chair. Um, happy to nominate Councillor Danny Cook. Okay, thank you very much. I have a seconder. Councillor Chris Cook, you happy to second? I am chair, yes. Thank you very much. Do we have any other nominations? No. All those in favour? Yep, thank you very much. That's passed. So he's not here tonight, so we'll give him something to do uh, before the next meeting. Uh, item three, the minutes of the previous meeting held on the 10th of March 2022 are here for approval. We need a second, uh, sorry, move and a seconder from those who are members of the committee at the time. So I'll move them. <laughs> you happy to second them? Then there's two, I think. Thanks, uh, Councillor Goodall. Do we have a vote if no one else was on here at the time? Still, Still vote. All those in favour? Yeah, great. Thank you very much. We'll sign those as a true record. Item four, declarations of interest. Please can ask whether there are any interest to be declared on any item we're due to discuss tonight. Nope. Um, update from the chair. Nothing in particular. I um, just want to thank, about to tell me something, no. Um, just uh, thanks everyone for putting me back in the chair. And uh, hopefully we can have a good year. We have had the last year was very good. Had good input from everybody that was on the committee. And um, now's the time to look at the work plan later on and build out what we're going to do this year. Item six, responses to reports of the Corporate Scrutiny Committee, non to report um, as yet. There is a March Corporate Scrutiny Committee meeting uh, where, sorry, a report where we considered Solway. Um, and Cabinet will be considering an update on that on 30th of June. So we might see something come back on that. Seven, no matters referred to us at this stage. As we said, it's the first meeting of the year, so that's unlikely. And then we're on to the forward plan. So has everyone had a chance to look at the forward plan? And are there any items you want to add to our work plan that aren't already on there? No. Okay. And for those who are new to the committee or committees, the forward plan is essentially looking ahead to the next three months of items that are coming through, um, I believe, to cabinet and f and or full council, and then we can um, choose for them to come here and be scrutinised before they get to that point, so we can have some input before the decisions are made. Okay. So that moves on to the first proper item, nine, which is the quarter four. 2021-2022 performance report. Um, it's a report of the leader of the council, Jeremy Oates. So we'll hand over to Jeremy and then we'll get into questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and committee. Um, we're in that unusual period where you're a new committee, but you're considering the final quarter of last year's performance reports. Uh, so, so this is all historic and refers to, to, to the last year as opposed to the current one. Um, the report is in the normal style and it goes through the different uh, corporate projects, uh, regeneration projects, impacts of welfare reform, uh, the financial situation and a finance health check. Uh, and for those who've been on the committee for a while, you'll, you'll be familiar with the, with the sorts of things uh, we see. Um, so very briefly, starting off with the reset and recovery or recovery and reset programme. I have to get that the right way around because I get told off. Um, You'll notice that everything is on schedule uh, to proceed with, uh, with where we are on that one. The two big things uh, that are still coming up 
are the relocation of the council following the decommissioning of Marmion House. Uh, that still needs to be bottomed out. Uh, and the other significant area is the service redesign. Uh, so this is where we're going to go through each and every service that we offer as a council uh, and look at where, um, where, where there's excess demand or, or where we can do things differently uh, and improve efficiency and improve uh, the demand situation. So reset and uh, recovery and reset is, is pretty much on target as to where it should be. Uh, and those two pieces of work uh, are, are, are coming up and still need uh, still need a bit of work doing it on them. Uh, if you scroll down to page three of the of the report, you've got the reset and recovery critical path uh, milestones. Oh, you'll notice that a lot of those are now marked off as complete. Uh, you see halfway down the service redesign elements that I mentioned a short while ago, uh, and we've still got some questions uh, within that service redesign as to how we link in with the third sector. And, and what the customer offer is. Uh, in terms of building requirements uh, later on, um, this is in terms of the long-term solution. So we've, we've initially got to get through the sh short-term uh, and medium-term solutions as to uh, decommissioning Marmion House and where we're going to go and what we're going to do. Uh, and then the, the larger project is where, we will, where we'll end up uh, once we've done that uh, as, a, as a permanent base and what that permanent base looks like. Um, so moving on, if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, you'll see the corporate project summary, uh, the reg status uh, with all of those uh, are now in green with the exception of the implementation of the customer portal. Uh, and that's due to the delays that this committee has already looked at. Was I think it was this committee uh, already looked at in terms of the de delay in implementation. Um, so, so the post implementation review uh, we've started phase one, but we haven't got the, the full data on that. Um, really, it's, uh, it's, it's about testing and uh, improving that works. Now we've finally got, now we've finally got it. It seems to have been around uh, almost as long as I have. Um, general fund, uh, you'll see the, the tables you've got there that, uh, that the committee has requested in the past. Um, in terms of the general fund, we've had a positive uh, outturn to last year. Uh, which has eased the financial position a little bit over the period of the medium-term financial strategy. Uh, and that puts us in a, a more favourable posi position than we had predicted. Uh, and just scrolling down, uh, you'll see details on that on page 16, which shows the variance and the ramifications of that going over the, 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 next, the next five years uh, of the MTFS plus, plus two years extra. You'll also see we've had a positive outcome to the housing revenue account uh, and that's in, significant, in more improved surplus uh, than we were anticipating uh, at the time when we set the budget back in February. Um, all those savings and income that we've generated through the year has been rolled back on a quarterly basis. So you'll see the figures aren't the huge figures that we normally see with it all collated into one because they've been profiled back in and we've already accounted for those in, in previous quarterly performance reports. Um, in terms of the capital uh, and the variance, uh, you, members will notice that there's a variance of about £12 million in the Assistant Director Growth and Regeneration, uh, and the majority of that relates to the large regeneration projects uh, that we, we currently have underway and some, uh, some movement in when we're anticipating paying for property or, uh, or, or handing over cash, but that's still within the, the programme of, of, of projects. Uh, it's just a case of it doesn't tie quite in with the with, uh, with the budgeting cycles that we that we have at the local authority. So, so whilst that variance seems significant, it's it's by nature of the beast. It's part of the uh, of the way that the project has has moved around. Um, this committee in the past has had asked for regular updates um, on universal credit and the impact on particularly our own council tenants. Um, and I've lost the page number now, um, but we're looking at um, uh, looking at the number of council house tenants who are in arrears who are on universal credit compared with those who are not uh, in arrears who are on uh, universal credit. Uh, I've got it on page 11 of the report. Um, and you'll see that the percentage of council tenants on universal credit in rent arrears is 46.3%. And if you look 12 months ago, at the end of quarter four for last year, 
that was at 46.9 percent so they're, they're pretty much where they were last year with a small increase of 0.6 percent um and obviously that's reflected in the figures with the percentage of the council tenants who are not who are on universal credit but not in rent arrears i think the the, the important thing with this um and i, I, I was talking to a committee member before we started um, we've talked about these figures a lot over the last few years with the implementation of, uh, of universal credit um, but if we look at the gross number of figures uh, gross number of um, people on universal credit who are council tenants it's 1617 um, which is a significant figure in itself however if we look at the number of properties we have it's running at around a third of the number of properties uh, of the number of council tenants that we have uh, around universal credit. So that's just just gives us a bit of context as to uh, as to the size of of the issue with the with, with those. Um, so that's all I've really got to point out based on what we've discussed previously at committee. Uh, if I may be so bold, Mr. Chairman, uh, we're about to start. Well, we've started a new year, so you're about to start a another cycle of quarterly performance reports uh, coming soon. I can't remember the last time that your committee influenced what was included in the performance report. Um, the, the, the report comes in my name, but I'm willing to present what performance indicators you guys want to see. Uh, so, so I don't know if, uh, if you want to have uh, a bit of time thinking about that at some stage, but if you want some different performance indicators and, and KPIs, then, then we can work on getting those in, included in the report. So, so the report's showing what you want to see rather than what I want to give you, as it were. Uh, so I'd, I'd welcome that discussion at some point. But that's, uh, that's all I've got on the QPR report. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for that. Um, I should have said this at the start, so for new members on the committee. QPR, the quarterly performance report, is obviously what it says on the tin. It's a report of the last quarter's performance. Um, and there's a series of graphs so you can see trends. So you, instead of looking at something having gone down this quarter, you can look at, does it always go down in that quarter? What's the trend? Um, and we in this committee can query, question, and just check that the council is delivering on its objectives, basically. It's our opportunity to do that. Um, regarding the point on shaping the report so i think some of the the, the summaries the executive summaries we shaped the this trend graphs we shaped and the project highlight reports were shaped however i think that probably or potentially is an argument to say now that there are so many key things going on in the next few years should we be tweaking it to more align to that that's a, a, a potential uh, question but uh, certainly the, the trends and things weren't there before um, so, if we go out to questions from everyone, I've got a couple of items. That's all right. So, firstly, the um, the graphs on on the page twenty and twenty one of the whole pack, the ones that look like this. If we could, whoever put the report together, perhaps look at grouping it by month or something. Because at the moment, it seems like it's I think it's fortnightly. It's really hard to see. It's really hard to sort of gauge one against the other. I don't know if anyone else felt that, but it, you know, it looks nice across the page, but you can't see what it's showing you. Uh, this is like the council tax current year collection and the um, NNDR collection, etc. I think there's, there's too much in there, I think, would be, would be my view to be able to see properly. Um, next one, there's a corporate project called Net Zero, I can't find it now. Net zero carbon, right, which is obviously due date of 2050, because that's when the, the legislation states. Has there been any work done on milestones shorter than 2050, so we can kind of break it down a bit in here, so we can track whether it's actually, I know it's a long, long way away, but is it on track to get to that? Is there any, any milestones shorter than 2050? Okay, thank you. Um, I think the, the, the point you make is significant. Uh, particularly when we're talking climate change, 2050 is is the end date, for want of a better phrase. Uh, and it's actually what, what's important is what we're doing now, not what we're doing in 2049. Um, we have uh, a, a timeline uh, with a number of a number of elements to it. We're currently uh, awaiting response from a from a consultant we procured to take on a 
uh, an exercise with a, a base rating to give us our our net our current uh, uh, net carbon uh, base for the borough council. Um, that piece of work is ongoing, and I'm expecting that back in the next couple of months. I think there was a September time timeline on that, so that will give us a figure and also a direction in terms of what the areas of focus are. Uh, this is also being picked up by the Staffordshire Sustainability Board um, because you know we, we can't combat this in isolation. Uh, and one of the big things that's come out of that, and I'm expecting to come out of the, cons consult the consultants' report in September time, is the differences between what we can control, what we have influence over, and what we can't, and what we don't have influence over, and also compared with other authorities. And the reason the comparison with other authorities is important is if we look across Staffordshire, there are only two authorities that have their own, their own housing stock. So our housing stock is part of our carbon contribution. And we can directly control that. So actually, whilst it gives us a, a, a larger headache, it also gives us more opportunity to get our teeth into, into some of those things. Um, so, so it's important that we that we get that comparison because otherwise we'll be in a situation where we will have some spurious headline somewhere that we're lagging behind because we're you know locked into x number of tons of carbon that uh, there is a result of, of not being comparable with the next one. Um, but once we get an understanding of that, we can then move forward. So, so the big the big one for now is that consult consultants report and the uh, sustainability board, uh, the countywide sustainability board. They will give us the dropouts for. Uh, for, for, for a programme of, of improvements and, and implementation. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll jot down a quick note and I'll see if we can get a, a briefing note to you so that will help you at a later point if you want to include that in the report or look at forward plan stuff. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, it's good to hear. So I think it's easy to think it's 2050, it's so many years away, we don't need to worry about it now, but it'll soon come around. And I certainly, I think whilst, personally, whilst I'm on the council and whilst anyone's on the council, I'd like to feel that we've done something towards it and we don't just you know stitch up the next group that come in 15 years time and they've got no hope of doing it um okay cool yeah that'll be good and uh, that's probably an item potentially once those milestones are there that we can get put into this this report and i had one more item just if you look at the uh, program highlight reports so an example page 40 of them of the main pack organization development for example um uh, let's have a look. So you've got things like the due date, September 2021. Uh, December 2021 with the green. So they, they can't be green, surely. I'm just, just, just reading those, I would say they've been completed. Which ones are you referring to? So they've got due dates in the past. So if, if the, unless it's just a strange way of reporting it as green because they're complete, but normally you change the state so it's complete. But yeah, I think I think they're still on there. I think that needs right, okay. they, they need uh, some uh, some sanitising. Yeah. Okay. So maybe the the project status uh, the key at the top probably has a, a dark blue or something. It's complete, just so it's clear because it looks like we're reporting them as green and they're during the past. Yeah. So I won't bother going through the others, they're all the same. So, I've spoken for a while now. Anyone who's new, you can ask anything you want. It's a calm, flexible, relaxed committee and we can ask anything we want in here. Councillor Goodall. Thanks, Chair. And uh, thanks to the leader for that, uh, that overview. Um, the custom portal, um, Obviously, we, 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 we've spoken about this at a previous, previous committee, and it's, we're obviously looking back on the report. Um, and we're, we're sort of not on track, but in control. I'm just wondering if there's any comments, really, on as we, as we move forward, if, that is, if there's any thoughts on whether that will slip or, or come back into control. Thank you. Uh, in terms of um, in terms of specifics, uh, you'll have to explain what you're after. Uh, in terms of the the customer portal, it's now up and live, so it's uh, so so it's up and running, uh, and it's just about usage and 
uh, and, and and how it follows through uh, the, the process. Um, at the time of this report, we were still implementing it, uh, so so I think it's a it's a time lag issue on that one. Uh, but if there's any any specifics, then yeah, we can I can I can pick that up and get feedback for you. No, no, that's that's fine. I think I think it is just the the, the, the time lag that's. Uh, I think it can be a little bit confusing, perhaps because we're looking at it three, four, five months sort of uh, in the past. Thank you. Councillor People. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a couple of points, but the first one probably relates to Councillor Goodall's point, um, and it also relates to the relocation of services and the loss of Marmion House. Um, we're getting a number of residents who are saying to us, we don't know where to go, we've got nobody to talk to, there's no public face, there's no, sorry, public facing um, face of Tamworth Borough Council. And if you've got issues with the portal as well, I appreciate they may now be resolved, but um, when are we going to actually get a, a place where people can go that's not the assembly rooms, which people feel is tucked away and they don't know it's there, um, so that people feel that we actually are a listening council and we are interested in their issues. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for that. That's, that's a good point. And actually, your, uh, your lovely husband brought it up before and we added it as a, um, a point to Cabinet about signposting properly, at least. Um, I should add, um, we've, we have not conferred. And I'm not psychic. <laughs> um, we obviously think as well. There we go. So yeah, so that would be uh, yeah. But it has gone to cabinet before about signposting. So link to that. So it'd be good to get an update, please. Okay. So um, yes, yeah, so the signage has been improved uh, at, at Marmion. Um, the point on the uh, on the customer portal. The customer portal doesn't add many more services that are available online. They were online anyway. Uh, and they're also uh, contactable through through the, the, the through the customer call centre, uh, for want of a better phrase. Uh, what the portal does is puts them together for the individual uh, customer, so they can they can trace all the different issues they've got in in different areas, rather than just submit a a, a form and wait for wait for feedback. They can, they can now trace it. So so that's the the additionality that the that, that the portal has brought to us. Um, in terms of uh, a future a future desk. Um, I'd like it to be a damn sight quicker than it is, uh, and we've had some issues with with finding a location for that. Uh, we've got a board meeting this Friday, he says, hoping he's not looking at next week's diary. Um, if it's not this Friday, it's next Friday, but it's <laughs> it's coming up very soon uh, for the Re Recovery and Reset uh, Board, and we'll receive an update there as to what the options are uh, and how quick we can turn around a, a new presence uh, in, in the town centre. Um, so if I, if I may feed back after we've had that board meeting, um, because it's so close, I, I'd rather give you accurate, accurate information based on that next week rather than, uh, rather than speculate. Um, but yeah, it, we, we need to get moving on that. Uh, we, we really do. Um, we have seen an increase in contact uh, from the public and Townsborough Council uh, over, over the last two years. Um, I could sit here and go, that's because everyone's contacting us by email and, and whatever else. But, but uh, I, I think that would be disingenuous. I think there's been a shift in the demand for public sector during the pandemic years. And I think that's driven that extra contact. Uh, whereas pre-pandemic, people were very much, I live my own life and don't want the, the public sector telling me what to do and, and doing everything for me. I think during the pandemic, there was an increased um, demand on the public sector. Uh, so, so it'd be difficult to argue that we've had an increased demand because we're because we're good and we've got all the all the access points. I think it's been driven by by something else, um, but it's promising that we've been able to cope with those. Um, but yeah, if I can if I can give you accurate details after that board meeting, um, I'm trying to look at my diary. It's not opening, uh, but it's either it's either this week or next week. But it's it's in the near future. Thank you. So, Joe, could we could we make sure that's an action then? So, once you've had the meeting, you we get an answer to the. Committee members, yeah, is that okay? Yeah. Any other questions? To finish, I think that was John that time. Councillor Harper. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Uh, 
basically really just to reiterate what uh, council people were saying i've had um, a number of people coming up to me over the last two three four weeks um asking where they can go to find information particularly about the 150 pound um fund that haven't been paid yet and um they want to talk to someone i've told them the um the assembly rooms and so forth um people are very very reluctant to go in my experience anyway, reluctant to go into the assembly rooms to talk about private matters uh, i know that in the past we have also relied on statistics that have um, indicated that the number of people in the attending the assembly rooms is um is very low um, i don't think that's at all surprising because people simply aren't going there um, they're asking well i can only spot my own my own opinion they're asking me um, rather than going to the council death because there isn't one or they don't want to go to it so the only point i'm trying to say is please don't rely on statistics and people um just jotting down a number of people who may have visited a particular uh, area or gone to the loo or whatever it is or walked through the door because I don't think they're at all accurate. Certainly not in my uh, my experience. Council people myself were at a meeting, um, a residence meeting recently and um, at, a, at a, a residential home and people just didn't know where to go. So I agree with you, um, leader the um this is absolutely imperative that we get somewhere very soon and that we advertise it and um, staff it properly thank you thank you very much you don't, you don't want to go back in there or do you um i think what we what we've got to remember is it's, it's not just about statistics because we can reel off the statistics for how many people came to the front desk when when, when that was open uh, and, and that in itself was a was a low figure. Um, the, the the position that the, that the board is in uh, and the cabinet is in is we have a direction given to us by full council to deliver, and that's what we're basing our our approach on. Um, and that went through back in back in August last year. So we're delivering what what the the, the council chose to do. In terms of the commitment we've made to a front desk. Um, that commitment's still there, and as soon as we can get somewhere, uh, we will do, like, like I suggested. Um, once again, though, like everything, that will form part of the service reviews. So whilst we, we, we're looking at front desk, what I can't do today is tell you what demand will be like in five years' time, or, or what that front desk will look like in five years' time. Uh, so, so we do have to remember we have to be fluid uh, in, in our approach to, to everything, whether it's a front desk, whether it's a call centre, whether it's uh, a customer portal. Um, the, the, the customer facing side is a reactionary service. The difficulty we have is historically, demand has been driven for a number of other reasons, uh, which we've, some people call it waste demand. I, I, I don't like that phrase, but I can't think of a better one off the top of my head. Uh, and this is, we, we used to get a lot of people coming into Marmion House to say hello to the member of staff because the member of staff was sat there with, with no one else there. So they popped in every Tuesday to say hello to, uh, to I was going to name a member of staff, then I shouldn't, sorry, get into trouble with that. Um, so, so we do need to make sure that we, uh, we are fluid enough to, to respond to it. Um, and we also need to make sure that we, and it's a point that John raised about relying on statistics, that we're measuring the right things uh, and, and getting an accurate an accurate picture but yeah that will all form part of the the service reviews going forward because we will have to continue to do to do those as we as we roll this project out okay thank you council people just a very brief comment if i may chair um i i hear what you say but don't forget that just somebody coming in to say hello to the person behind the desk is probably providing a very important public service to somebody who may not have other social contact at all during the week so we we need to have a face and I, I know you appreciate that yeah um 
But turning to another matter, my question, and apologies, because I've not been on this committee before, so I may be asking questions that have already been asked and uh, many times. Um, but you mentioned the Solway project and that um, a recommendation is going to Cabinet on the 30th of June. So I wondered if you can give any more details at this stage. Uh, if I may, Mr Chairman, the Solway report came through this committee as a confidential item. So I can't comment on what this committee's recommendation was, uh, and it's going to Cabinet as a confidential item. Uh, I think the minutes of this meeting record, I was looking at them earlier actually, no, I've, I've already closed them, um, they, they record that a recommendation is being made, uh, but I, I, I don't think I can go into that detail in open session. Uh, I'll update you afterwards. I mean, it sounds really exciting and secret, but it's not exciting at all. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll tell you after. Thanks, I appreciate that. Any other questions before I come back in? No. Um, <clears throat> on the graphs where we've got the universal credit, uh, universal credit overall seems to have slightly dipped. But then counter tenants on universal credit has, has gone up. Um, and I just wondered what, obviously we're talking about universal credit, I'm assuming still not everybody's on universal credit, is that still being rolled out? If, and if not, what's the figure, is there a figure in mind where if we get up to X amount of people on that, that we start to be really concerned about the situation in the town? Okay. Um believe almost everybody's on universal credit now who, who, who's who's been shifted across um and i know it, all new claimants after a certain date were we were on universal credit um we didn't set a threshold where we had a, a level of concern but the reason it was included in this report uh, and, and brought to you um was not about the number of universal credit claimants in tamworth it was about the impact on our services. Uh, so, so, so the number itself isn't the issue. It's the it's the uh, it's the impact on not only their demand for services, but also the ability to pay council tax and to pay rent or, or whatever else. Which is why we, we specified uh, specified the rent areas. So, so those graphs there, uh, whilst they show the number of people on on, on universal credit, they really don't have the context of the impact of that on uh, on the local authority um at the moment um we we we're, we're dealing with the impact and and you'll notice the rent arrears in quarter 4 are down as they as they are each year uh, and and council tax arrears aren't, aren't spiraling um so so at the moment if you look at those two indicators it's uh, it, it's one of those things that we need to keep an, an eye on but it's not having a significant impact um, and as far as I'm aware, we're not having a significant increase in the number of uh, requests for council housing and, uh, and and things like that. So, so it's not about a, a crucial figure we hit and we panic. It's about the impact on uh, on on either our demand for services or or on our our, our revenue streams through the um, uh, through council tax and rents. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's good to hear. I mean, that, that was kind of the the point I was trying to make, but didn't work very well. Was basically the the impact of it and what that then means for our town. But if, if we're not seeing all the other indicators go up, then then that's a that's a good thing. Councillor Cook. Um, if I can just add on that as well. Um, not everybody over at Tamworth is also on um, <laughs> Universal as well. There are still a few who are actually on the older service as well. So any impact we get on the universal, that might also get affected once everybody's over that as well. Yeah, of course. Sorry, if, if I may come back. Um, I'll just scroll through and if you look at uh, another example is the local council tax reduction scheme and also some discretionary uh, benefits that, that we're able to uh, to give out. Just picking up on uh, what Chris said, about, we've still got a few that, that haven't changed over. The problem we were seeing when Universal Credit started was 
not just the number of people claiming, and now, now that's what we look at because of the, the concern with the, the direction of the economy, etc. Uh, but at the time, there was a very long uh, turnaround period for claimants. Uh, and we were very concerned that actually that was generating uh, uh, problem, problems with rent and, and, and other things. The only thing we could measure was our rental income. So, so it wasn't just about the figures, it was also about that time lag uh, and that overlap. So, so whilst they're still in there now, it's a slightly different focus. Uh, and, and we can manage things differently. It was that, that initial turnaround when it was, I think it was 16 weeks at one point, was having a real impact on, on people's ability to, 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 to pay and live and, uh, and what have you. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to, to remind people of, of the picture then when we, when we first looked at that. Yeah, thank you. I think we actually recommended in here at one point for a letter to go out to the question that, that delay. Councillor people. Just on the topic of, of rents and rent arrears, there was some concern, I think it's probably a couple of years ago now, when the government decided not to pay rent direct, but to pay it to the claimant who then had to be responsible for their own rent. There was some real concern that that would result in a higher level of rent arrears. And I just wondered if we've got any stats on that and whether that concern actually has come to fruition or not. If you don't, if you don't answer that, well, then take it away. It's a good, it's a good question. I'm, I'm happy to get an answer at a later yeah. stage, Chair, but I am interested to know whether it has had any impact or not. We, we love a written answer in here as well. I, I, can't, see, I, I can't see it in the report. I'll, I'll get that information to you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? No. Okay. <clears throat> so we haven't raised any um, other recommendations today, um, but it does include a recommendation for us to endorse the report. Um, and as is customary, there's an accompanying sheet that goes to Cabinet that calls out all the things that we have raised um, so they can see what, what we're talking about in here as well. So I need a, a mover and a seconder, please, to endorse the report. Councillor Goodall and Councillor Cook. Okay. Thank you. And obviously thank you to the uh, officers and everyone involved in preparing the report. Um, do we need to vote on that, really? Yeah. Let's have a vote. Yep. Cool. Thank you. Unanimous. All right. Um, I would propose, perhaps, that... If anyone is interested in joining me, we we put together an underutilised thing in this committee, so a working group, and to look at QPR and is it aligned to the strategy for the next sort of five, ten years, based on all the major projects that are going on. If anyone wants to join me in that, thanks, Simon. Anybody else? Chris, okay. That's, that's a group. Okay, so we'll do a small working group. We'll have a look at that and then report back to the committee on what we think. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, that moves on to item 10, which is asset management strategy. This committee, committee uh, previously received an update um, in February, and we requested a further update on progress later in the year. So we have Paul Weston, Assistant Director of Assets, here to take us through that. So over to you, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, it's a fairly brief update on this one. Uh, we're still largely in sort of data collecting stages. Uh, so from progress since the last time I came to this uh, group, we have now completed a revaluation of our assets. Uh, so that, that piece of work was done by a firm of external valuers, uh, JLL. So we now have all the asset values uh, for all of our assets, but I'm always, I think the, you know, probably fair to say the asset management strategy is largely focused around built assets. Uh, that's a piece of work that's done every year as part of, sort of our annual accounting reports, but that information will also feed back into the asset management strategy around things like valuation of properties and net present values and uh, that sort of stuff. We've completed structural surveys now on our high-risk buildings, so that's predominantly the high-rise blocks. Uh, 
it was required by the Building Safety Act, but it also will feed into that asset management strategy around stock condition and any information. Uh, it goes above and beyond the normal stock condition data that we collect on properties. At the same time, we've also completed a sample survey on our non-traditional properties. So those will be you know, sort of the weights, areas, uh, wimpy, no finds type properties. Again, that's in addition to the normal stock condition survey because they have a sort of, a, I suppose, a, a special uh, requirement around that structural elements to them uh, to ensure that they're still performing for us. We've completed all the fire safety surveys uh, on the high risk buildings as required by the Building Safety Act and the budgets are set aside to undertake any works arising from those surveys. So again, that's a piece of work that's in hand. There's a draft asset management do uh, strategy document being produced. It's not actually been reviewed by the asset strategy steering group yet, which is why it's not been circulated sort of wider to this group. Uh, I'm sure that draft document will see a number of amendments following conversations with the members of that group. Uh, so I think, you know, I'd rather bring a, a near finished draft than sort of an early draft to this group. It's a high level document. It sets out sort of our reasons and rationale for owning property and assets. Uh, why, why do we have them and what's the purpose of those? Uh, still need to agree the governance around that. And again, that's part of the uh, conversation with the asset strategy steering group. Uh, but there will also be some conversations with the portfolio holder uh, around sort of how we, how we deal with the governance on that. Uh, the view is, it would need approval by cabinet, but it's then sort of what delegated powers would be dropped down into uh, officers and portfolio holder for that. We have undertaken some restructuring of the assets team to provide some additional capacity. Uh, we've bought, or we're recruiting for uh, an additional commercial, commercial lettings assistant the aim being that that will actually allow the sort of qualified surveyor that we have to get on with those bigger pieces of work around sort of major rent reviews, uh, ground rent reviews and stuff like that. The, the stuff that brings the money in, to be honest with you. So it's, it's those those uh, rent reviews and to sort of to yield the greatest returns. That junior member of staff will effectively deal with tenancy management and enforcement of tenancy conditions. Again, an important role because those are the bits where there are conditions within certain leases that require our tenants to do repairs uh, and we need to try and enforce those so that basically that reduces our expenditure on properties and also results in properties that come back to us being the fit for state, uh, fit for let state. Uh, so that, that's in there and like I said, that's going through the recruitment process at the moment. We've outsourced our asset valuation process in previous years, we've had an external agent value the housing stock and our own uh, value app has done our non-housing stock. So by freeing up that resource and going external, again, that's freed up that officer's time to deal with sort of lettings, rent reviews, uh, and sort of that commercial income generation side rather than doing valuations. Uh, it was something that used to take two to three months a year out of, of that person's time in just doing valuations, which was something that we have to do uh, for accounting purposes, but actually it doesn't really generate any income for us because they're not, it's not involved in managing properties. Uh, and the sort of final bit in terms of where we are in progress is we've uh, started to look at asset viability modeling software and how we deal with that, and that'll be important for the next stage. Aligned with the draft asset management strategy, there are an update process map for asset management planning, uh, as well as draft revisions to our acquisitions and disposals policies. So those will all fit into uh, that piece of work. Uh, as Councillor Oates said earlier, the, there is some work going on around the net zero carbon. Uh, we fed into that process for all of our stock so that's housing and non-housing stock. Uh, and again, looking at that as part of the asset management strategy as to how that ties in with other policies and strategies such as net zero carbon. So upcoming work for us now is we need to do some more work around promoting our investment property. 
uh, we don't have large numbers of empty property at the moment in terms of our investment stock. Uh, and those that are, several in the town centre, are forming part of the wider town centre projects. So, you know, we wouldn't be actively looking to let those. Uh, but what we do need to do is get something out there and sort of a bit more proactive marketing around sort of our, anything we do have available. As I say, the draft document needs to go through the asset strategy steering group for comment. It is out in circulation to that group. Uh, the next meeting of that group is in September. So the view is that by that meeting, we'll have an almost ready to go draft document uh, before it goes through the cabinet process. I believe the target date for that is October uh, in our sort of a business plan. So that's sort of where we're looking at at the moment. And I think we're on track for that, uh, to get that through to the cabinet process around about October, November time. We need to look at the uh, asset viability modeling software. We need to make a decision whether that's something we purchase or whether it's something we look to develop our own. Uh, because we don't have a massive property portfolio, it may be something we can actually do internally uh, through use of just sort of spreadsheets and databases, but we need to look at that and you know, sort of see what's available to us. Once we've run the properties through that viability modeling, that will generate then asset management plans for individual properties or groups of properties. Uh, and the usual around that is you, you start with putting them into a red, amber, green categories. So green is stuff that you really don't need to worry about. It's, it, it shows a return on investment. It's a viable property. You can carry on with it. Red properties are those that are not performing either financially or physically, or they're no longer fit for purpose. And then the amber properties are those marginal ones. They probably break even, but they're not great. Generally, what you do is it, the first the first round would be to look at the red and amber properties and either recategorize them as green by saying with some investment they can go into green or actually we need to either look at disposal or repurposing or whatever else. So that's that first piece of work that needs to go on once we've got those asset management plans developed. Look at, we need to look at how all, all of the other strategies link together. So that's regeneration, uh, the levelling up fund that's coming through, uh, it's going through the process at the moment, there's net zero carbon, and all of those other uh, things that were coming up on the agenda. We know that on the housing side, with the housing regulator, there's likely to be a decent homes plus or something along those lines coming forward. So again, it's how all of those feed into that asset management strategy and that sort of forward planning for budgets. Uh, and then it's about implementation of those plans. Now, the asset management strategy as I've drafted at the moment is looking for the period through till 2027. Uh, it's normal to do, do a review on a five-year cycle. Again, that's something that you know, hasn't been agreed by the asset strategy steering group yet uh, and would need to go through the governance process, but that's the sort of normal cycle that you look for for this type of thing. Uh, so really, you know, the, the implementation phase as a minimum is three to five years, but where assets are identified for possible regeneration, that could extend beyond. But at that point, they fall into a different piece of work and they become a project in their own right. So that's where we are at the moment with it. Uh, the target dates for the strategy part, like I say, was September 22, uh, sorry, October 22. So I think we're still on target for that, subject to the asset strategy steering group meeting in September and sort of being, being willing to sign the draft off to go through the formal process. Uh, as part of it, we're also gonna to have to look at things like, you know, return on investment for assets versus return on investment for other investment type uh, arrangements and our assets, certainly the investment property assets, the right investment for the organization. Uh, and that's something obviously, you know, conversation with the f colleagues in finance will have to look at that for us. Uh, so that, those are other things that need to come forward. And that, that's all part of that strategic view around it. So it's not just operational. It's looking at, so what else uh, could we do 
because our investment properties are held for the purposes of generating additional income to the council. Uh, there's, all, there's a risk management element of it that we need to look at. Uh, as you're aware from sort of our accounts, one of our largest sources of income uh, on our investment property is Ankerside. Uh, and it accounts for quite a large proportion of our income. So again, there's a risk associated with having all your eggs in one basket, so to, say, so to speak. So that will all factor into it as part of that process. Uh, and like I say, the asset management plans will then drop out from that, and they then form part of that process around uh, budget setting and the medium-term financial forecasts. So all of that slots together. So that's where we are at the moment. Like I say, it's a piece of work that's still bubbling under and still sort of progressing forward as planned. Uh, I think we're at a point now where all the data side is available to us, so it's really now sort of translating that into an output from that data. So that was the update from me for the time being. Uh, if there's any questions, happy to take them. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I've got a couple of questions, uh, if that's okay. The first one, um, it's a bit of a direct question, but maybe I latched onto the wrong thing. But you talked about investment properties, and we need we need to market them. Why they're not already being marketed? If they're there, they would generate income, and we know they're there. Why, why is that happening already? We have broad ad advertising through our website, and it's not particularly easy to find. If I'm being brutally honest. Uh, we don't have a major issue in letting property. We, t we generally have people wanting property. Uh, you know, it's fair to say our properties are at probably the lower end of the market in terms of rental values. So they attract a certain type of business, you know, generally those smaller startups uh, who are looking for you know, cheap premises to move into. So we don't have a particular issue with lettings. Uh, and other than the town centre properties, a couple of which were in an unlettable standard, we don't carry a lot of void property on our non-housing stock. So, I mean, we don't carry a lot of voids on our housing stock either, but so it, it's not been a particular issue, but I think it's something we just need to, to beef up a little bit to make it more obvious and a, a greater presence there. Uh, and I think it will also potentially drive down some of that demand for telephone conversations, because if people know that we haven't got property, uh, available at a given point in time, it means they're not bothering phoning us up to ask about the yeah. property. Uh, so it, you know, it covers both sides of it. But yeah, no, take your point on that. Okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned the acquisitions and disposal strategy, um, and then also I see these kind of joined up. But then you also mentioned reg, reg status on properties. So. I'm assuming the acquisition and disposal strategy is that totally joined up with all the different projects that are going on and you, you know, it's not kind of in, in isolation, doesn't take into account the needs of those projects. Effectively, the way, the way the policies are worded as drafted at the moment, disposals policy, we already have something, but it's fairly limited. Uh, so what this would do is there's a link in with the asset management strategy around if a property is underperforming or not in demand or, or whatever else, it, it sets out the, the process for that disposal. Uh, it sets out those fortuitous disposals where someone approaches us and wants to buy property or land. So it, set, it sets out the structure for that one. Acquisitions is largely around strategic acquisitions for our operational purposes. It does reference acquisitions for regeneration projects but it effectively I would see those as falling within the scope of that project and they have to stand up on their own two feet as part of that project or there has to be a justification within that project for that acquisition so that's the way we tend to work on on those I think it would be difficult to write a, an overarching policy around acquisitions that covered yep. all of those because that's I fair. think they need to fit with the project so again, we're not going to have a silly situation like a, a year's time where the project meets states we need to purchase something, but the policy says, well, that's not in our policy, so we, you know, we're not going to have that kind of situation. No, no. Effectively, it does it does make allowance for regeneration projects, okay. but it, it effectively pushes that decision making process around that acquisition into that particular project because I think that's it's a better fit. I think what we've seen with the with the town centre stuff is that really that has to form part of that overall project, make, you know, project and the decision-making for that project 
and the financial considerations for that project as opposed to being a totally separate uh, policy yeah. around disposals or acquisitions because like you say you could end up with conflict between the two and that doesn't work so by referencing it but saying it becomes part of the project allows for it within the overarching policy without being so detailed that okay. it actually prevents elsewhere okay that's good anyone else got any questions i've got a couple more if not councillor Harper. thank you chair <clears throat> do we have such a thing as um as a building or assets at risk register where buildings that are in a particularly parlous state are red flagged or whatever and um, attention is drawn to the fact that they need attention as it stands at the moment no uh, it's largely based on knowledge so you know, we don't own massive numbers of uh, properties so it's, it's largely based on personal knowledge what this will do is that I'll actually identify those properties uh, and they'll, they'll turn red for various reasons it could be that they require high levels of investment or that there's low demand or that there's no return on that investment the rental incomes aren't performing so there'll be various reasons why they're red that'll be flagged within that asset management plan and that then will drive a decision around what we do with it and that could be invest it could be looked to dispose it could be repurpose there's a range of things but that has to be looked at on an individual basis and it's the best thing for the property and the council uh, so that, that and that's the purpose of the asset management strategy and the plans that fall out from the asset management strategy uh, thank you if I, if I may just uh, obviously I'm looking at those buildings over the way which are in a parlous state and the reason they're in a parlous state is nothing's been done to them previous administrations have ignored them and left them <clears throat> and allowed them to fall into the state that they are this must surely not be allowed to happen it's a terribly bad way of managing buildings and managing assets to allow them to fall into a state where you then sort of got to throw cash at them to put them right again um, had those been addressed or the problems been addressed decades ago probably they wouldn't be in the we wouldn't be facing the problems that we are today um, so I think I think it's absolutely essential that we do identify properties that are failing and um, obviously if, if, if other public landlords were doing similar things we'd be uh, jumping down their throats to get it sorted but we're not doing it to ourselves thank you chair so I suppose the, the, the question on that then it have I'm assuming they have have processes changed since then to you know to, to better identify such properties before they get to that it's I, I've been here nearly 20 years and those properties were in that state almost that state when I started uh, they were sort of I think the the one of the larger units was just becoming empty at that point because it had fallen into that sort of state of disrepair I think the issue has been and will continue to be which is why it needs a strategic approach to it is that the the cost of bringing them back up to scratch at that point is so great you would never ever get a return on investment for them uh, and again that's where as part of that strategy we also need to be looking at how we leverage other funding uh, through things like future high street funds and, and and many other mechanisms because there will be some property where it's significantly underperforming it's in very poor condition but actually you would never get a return on investment if you try to uh, bring it back up to uh, up to standard so those units in particular I, I think at last count there was sort of you know a significant investment required in them to bring them back up to standard that they would probably never ever break even let alone return on investment uh, so that that's your strategic approach to it and like I say regeneration has to be one of the considerations in that okay thank you uh, is that on the same point or is it a different point okay yeah the only point I would make is the Houses of Parliament are currently undergoing a massive redevelopment. They will never get a return on that. Um, we have to um, not always look at the financial points. 
we have to look at the contribution particular buildings make to the the local environment and that is hugely important and something that should be taken into the equation thank you I, th I think you have to recognize that we hold different properties for different purposes uh, we have operational properties so those are places like the uh, Marmine House uh, and the depot we have heritage properties and leisure type properties so heritage properties buildings such as this the castle assembly rooms and then we have investment properties that their sole purpose for owning those properties is to show a return on investment so they actually are there to generate an income from the council so from an accounting purpose that's that's there that's why they exist uh, so those those type of properties you would really as part of any sort of strategic approach to it need to show that they are showing that return on investment if we want to hold them for historic reasons then we again that's a strategic decision that would need to make that shift from saying it's an investment property to being a heritage property or you know a, a, some sort of operational property so there is a process that we go through for that but investment properties are there for that purpose they are there to generate an income for the council uh, so we just have to be mindful of that whenever we're looking at that sort of planning and stra uh, strategic approach to it Okay, that's clear. Thank you. Council people. Well, you won't be surprised to hear that I'd like to come back on uh, comments made by Councillor Harper. Um, I don't think it's helpful or constructive to decide who's to blame, but I would remind everybody that the current administration has been in control for nearly 20 years and nothing's happened in that time. Um, the other point I think is, is well made, that um, we should be very careful about um, insisting that there has to be a return all the time. I appreciate um, the officer's point about um, that, that, that properties are designated for different things, but there's nothing to stop us redesignating a property if we think it's appropriate. I mean, we have had this conversation in other fora, and uh, at, at the risk of repeating oneself, um, we, we know that there are, are things that need to be done. Um, my question is actually about timescales and having timescales allocated to particular properties because without talking about those properties over there, there are other properties in the town which have sat empty literally for years um, and really for no good reason that anybody can see. Um, I'm sure if I was uh, to go to you with, with individual examples, you'd tell me exactly why they've set out MTV years. But I, I really do think that we need targets uh, to make sure that things don't slip and that we've got a methodology, and I'm sure you've got this in mind, to keep those targets under review and to make sure that we have a dynamic asset strategy. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, essentially, in terms of sort of the recategorization of properties that's the, the asset management strategy would allow for that uh, so when we said so those red amber greens anything that's in red and amber would be subject to review and one of the potential outcomes from that is repurpose uh, that would be a decision that i would would have thought that once the asset strategy steering group had suggested it would still need to go through the council uh, cabinet process and it would have to have a budget attached to it to to deal with it in terms of time scales again yet yeah, absolutely agree i think the the big factor in it will always be how much we need to spend and how much we have available to spend and again that return on investment comes into that process because that sort of will govern how much you can put into a property because you need to sort of generate income back from it or as a council we need to find money from somewhere else to to fund that but again all of that will factor into it and as part of those plans what you'll get is this is what we need to do with those properties and this is how much we need to invest in those properties and then it's a case of trying to align that with the budget and with any other priorities we might have uh, you know in terms of areas we might be looking to invest in or divesting uh, because that's again it's another outcome from uh, an asset management strategy is that it's not uncommon to say we will no longer invest in this area and it will be a planned withdrawal so th those are all sorts of things that it's flexible enough to la allow that but 
there will always be a budget associated with it that you have to work to, to, to get to that end outcome. And the timescales, I'm afraid, will very often be set around what's realistically achievable within the budgets that are available to us. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's one of those, some, some properties actually won't need much investment, others might need a lot more, and you know, it's how we do that. Uh, and also how we sort of fit those in with regeneration type projects that might be going on. Yeah, go on. Thank you for that. I don't think it quite answered my question, which is in the strategy, will there be timescales allocated? I, I honestly don't think we can allocate timescales until we've actually completed the asset management plans. The asset management strategy is that overarching document that sets up how you do the process, the rationale behind the process. The outputs from that will be a series of asset management plans for individual properties. Those are the plans that will say, are they red, amber, green? And what's, what needs to be done to those properties? So it, there'll be a piece of work then that sits behind that where each of those properties or groups of properties in some cases that are in amber or red categories will be looked at and some decisions need to be made then around so what is it we do with them to either bring them into the green category, repurpose, recategorise, dispose. So those are the decisions that end up being made and that's the point at which a time scale can be put on it because that's the point at which we'll know A, what is it we actually want to do with that property or group of properties and B, what's the, what's the investment requirements because those are the two key, key things in there is that it's hard to put a time scale on it if we don't actually know what it is we want to do uh, or we don't know what it's going to cost or how much money we need. So yes, there will be time scales, but that will be at the plan stage rather than the strategy stage. The st strategy is very much that overarching document that sort of sets the scene, if you like. Okay, thank you. And then to, to Councillor Harper's defence, I, I don't think he's making a political point it could very well have been meaning previous administration the leaders before councillor rose it could have been previous conservative ones that left it for labor one and vice versa i don't think it was a political point at all councillor harper thank you chair as um, as i'm sure you, you know i don't make political points i'm not i'm not a political animal um we just hopefully just do the right thing that's that's all um the point i wanted to bring up uh the flats are going to be a major, major issue in uh, in the short term, I suspect, with uh, in that they require considerable investment. What I want to know really is what is the projected lifespan of the, the flats? I mean, they're now 50, 60 years old. Um, have they got another 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years in them? I don't know. Have you got any idea, and can you give us a clue as to um, how long uh, it will take um, for them for the the concrete to fail or whatever, and uh, we have to think of something else? As it stands at the moment, and based on the structural surve surveys that we've had done, it's not shown any anything significant that would cause us any concerns for certainly the. The medium term future uh, it's, it's always hard to say I mean you know if you if you look at sort of average life cycles of buildings you know people will tell you 60 to 100 years on brickwork we've got properties here that have been 400 years and still standing quite happily so you know those are notional life expectancies there's nothing in there that says there's a problem I think you know certainly with some of our properties the bigger issue will be getting them up to things like thermal insulation standards more so than structurally uh, problematic uh, so in terms of those no no particular life I think you know at last count they were still giving them a 30-year life uh, in, in terms of that but that's normally because we do our surveys on a 30-year cycle in terms of you know when you do a stock condition survey it usually does a projection for the next 30 years I suspect in five years time when we are surveyed again they'll still get 30 years so you know it's just an endless 30 years until they get to a point where you're thinking actually they are coming to end of life yes they'll need maintenance that they always will uh, any property does uh, but we've always kept on top of it and again in terms of the fire safety stuff it's not showing anything significant 
The structural surveys don't show anything significant over there. Uh, so, you know, it will just be the normal routine course of investment. Again, as part of this process, we'll have a picture as to what that level of investment needs to be versus the return on investment versus potential other activities over there. But most of our housing stock, just by nature, the way it's sort of established, it's because it's been maintained over the years, will always show that break-even point. It's largely the the issues for a housing stock in terms of it showing red on the red, amber, green status is more demand and de desirability. Some areas aren't desirable. Some property types aren't desirable. Uh, but financially, they could work and sort of li longevity they, they've still got. Uh, so at this moment, it's not a major concern. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I did have two quick questions. <clears throat> One's linked back to what we talked about earlier about net carbon. So in the RAG statuses, the criteria to determine those RAG statuses, is net carbon been added? Because that seems quite a quick win if, if, if not. It will be a factor in our costings. We, we'll need to make a decision as to whether or not how that impacts on the red, amber, green. Uh, and also what, what we think our liabilities might be in the future. Uh, on the housing side, we're pretty certain that the there will be changes in regulation on the housing that will require more investment on uh, carbon. The commercial industrial stuff, not so sure about. Uh, there's minimum standards we'll have to meet, but where we have to go with it is an unknown. Uh, so yes, it will factor into it, but largely around the costing element of it, as opposed to uh, the, the performance. So, so in that example there where if, if new regulation comes out and that gives you a standard and now, so you then look at the cost to get that standard and that might mean it's red because it's just not worth that investment. For the, is that basically what you're saying? It, it's potential that it could push it into red, whether then we decide actually we still want to, to do that work because we want to retain the properties and we want to invest. Well, that's, that's, that's a decision that then has to be made based on the data that's presented and you know the whole purpose of that strategic document and those asset management plans is it gives you all the information to make the decisions and you know just because it's red it doesn't mean automatically you're not going to do anything with it it just means you need to look at it in a bit more detail and make a decision whereas the green almost you say well they're looking after themselves yeah. as long as you're spending the general maintenance budget and keeping on top of them you don't need to worry about them. It's really those red and ambers where you're looking at it in a bit more detail and saying, so what do we want to do? I mean, I think the big problem with the net zero carbon that we, that we have and will always have is we don't have many operational properties within our control. Yeah. So those are the buildings really where we decide what goes on in those buildings, how much electricity we use, how much heating we use and all that sort of stuff. On all of our other properties, we're not the tenant, we're not the occupier, so it's more difficult. So if an industrial unit wants to put their heating on full blast all day, every day, but leave the roller shutter door and all the windows open, there's not a lot we can do about that. That's not yeah. th that's how they operate their business. So it, whilst we can do our bit where we can, in, in terms of the overall net zero carbon, we can only do what's notionally right.